Hello, and thank you for joining us today. We are halfway through the week. And with me today is Simulations Plus founding scientist, Michael Bolger, who will describe the Gastro Plus DDI standards update project. Joining him for the Q&A session is Chief Scientist Viera Lukachova, Executive Director of Simulation Studies Grace Franchevich, and Scientist 2 Ravathi Chapa. A few housekeeping notes before we dive right in. We take your privacy rights seriously. By attending this event or participating in the Q&A session, you are allowing us to contact you for follow-up. You may ask questions via the questions panel on your dashboard at any time. A Q&A with today's panelists will immediately follow the presentation. Now, while a few of us get settled in, a quick get to know you question. Which sector best describes you? So I'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and submit your answer and a quick history lesson while you submit your answers. Mike joined Simulations Plus the same year of incorporation in 1996, and wasting no time, he programmed the very first version of Gastro Plus in 1997. Fast forward 24 years, he continues to work with our talented team of scientists and programmers on the next generation of modeling and simulation software, including solutions like the DDI Standards Project. Mike, I'd like to welcome you to the virtual table Take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arlene. I appreciate the uh, invitation from uh, Simulations Plus to give this uh, webinar. This has been a pretty extensive project. I was thinking back on my uh, my career, and I was actually a pretty bad student in uh, grammar school. Um, and when I went to high school, I was introduced to a slide rule. Um, this actually changed the course of my career. Um, a slide rule allowed me to do long division like a piece of cake, and uh, that was a launching platform. I really kind of had a, a good feeling for chemistry and biology and um, a number of other things, and so that that you know particular innovation sort of set me on the right track. Um, and since then, we've had I've watched the introduction of lots of new technologies like um, mainframes when I was an undergrad with punch cards, um, HP calculator and timeshare computers uh, when I was in grad school. Uh, I, we had a Tektronix standalone mini computer as a postdoc and I got my first IBM PC in uh, when I started as a professor at University of Southern California in the School of Pharmacy. Um, we had, I have had luggable PCs, work slates, laptops, surface computers, and uh, most recently, all of these tethers that uh, we now have around us, cell phones, smart cell phones, smart watches, and Microsoft Teams. Uh, however, I may not actually survive the latest innovation, and that is project managers. Um, I, I know what it feels like to, um, for Stephen Colbert to do these kind of uh, presentations, well, uh, you know, without a live audience, but it, it, it would be interesting to hear you. Um, so uh, we've been working on this um, Gastro Plus DDI standards update project for about a year and a half. And, um, you know, I guess the progress that we've made and the performance uh, Simulations Plus has decided to put me out to pasture later this year, so I'm wearing my uh, sail, sailboat t-shirt uh, shirt, and uh, getting ready to um, go on to the next phase. So I will start the uh, presentation. So the um, abstract is uh, probably available to you online, uh, partly, you know, involved in, you know, attracting people to the webinar. Um, the primary focus is going to be um, on how to approach and document any project that involves mechanistic absorption and PBPK simulations. <clears throat> Description 
of this uh, historical gastro plus database substrate and perpetrator standards i probably won't go into a lot of information about that but um, we've had a decades-long history of running um, drug drug interaction simulations and the piece that i think has been uh, missing with regard to a lot of that is the extensive documentation and development of the validation simulation models and, and distribution to our users. I think the results that you would get from this kind of simulation uh, haven't changed. We've really had a lot of good uh, results and people have used these in the past, but I think you're gonna find it a lot easier now to <clears throat> um, apply our standards to your new uh, novel compounds, whether they're substrates or perpetrators and uh, get uh, more quickly the uh, results that are needed by the project managers. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're gonna be making these available as time goes on and uh, mainly for users of Gastro Plus who have licensed DDI module can request that information. So the webinar is not gonna be a lecture about a list of simulated PBPK DDI results or account of documented substrates and perpetrators. However, in the next couple of slides, I'll help answer those questions just because I know they would probably come up near the end. And uh, I'm gonna flash through this pretty quickly, but um, this is a preliminary list. Um, these are ones that you know have been approached uh, in the company in the past, and we're always adding more new, new um, molecules. The list of the first few that um, we're going to be uh, adding all of this extensive documentation to is here. Um, and most of these we have gotten complete um, literature collections, um, model building and validation for um, single compounds, no problem. Uh, validation of all the mechanisms of the DDI were, um, you know, uh, who knows, maybe halfway through or more than that. And then, uh, as I'll describe in a minute, the documentation it will include not only a spreadsheet of the studies that are, have been conducted and a uh, compilation of the results, but it will also include the PowerPoint slides that could be used to present to different groups or your internal project teams and the Word reports that can be just cut and pasted into your own submissions. So here's the outline for a process of model development and documentation. <clears throat> this uh, creation of a GastroPlus project, I believe, starts with structure import using uh, the ADMET predictor module for both substrates and perpetrators. And the first step would be physical chemical, biopharmaceutical, and biochemical properties that are calculated just simply from the structure. An initial um, evaluation via chemistry classification for all aspects of ADMET. And um, that we've you know, heard that uh, you know, this M uh, may need to be modified to uh, C because the routes of clearance are probably more important than just metabolism. And these, you know, gastrointestinal factors, um, influx and efflux transporters, um, metabolic, biliary, and renal <clears throat> um, clearance are all going to be uh, initially handled from a purely in silico uh, simulation. Extensive literature collection and spreadsheet documentation. So once you get that idea of what the drug should be doing, what it looks like. Um, from the point of view of the models that have been built through uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning in uh, ADMET predictor, then you need to go out and find out how close the uh, information is to the uh, unit literature and the um, information that would be generated within your own project uh, uh, development. So put all that information from in vitro studies and in vivo studies 
into the uh, spreadsheet and that will be available for each one of these standards. Then we do some initial simulations of the measured properties with parameter sensitivity analysis. Um, we do model building for substrate and or perpetrator simulations compared to the observed data for single escalating doses to check out for nonlinear dose dependence and understanding of what is the primary uh, mechanism for that nonlinearity, whether it's uh, biopharmaceutical properties like saturation of solubility or if it's uh, saturation of either um, you know gut or liver enzymes or transporters and then uh, on to um, multiple dosing to with the DDI module for testing auto inhibition and auto induction. The uh, DDI simulations you know should include all the appropriate mechanisms for both the substrate and perpetrator. <clears throat> and these uh, simulations will have, have changed over time since we first started in the, um, you know, 2008, 2009 timeframe to the present time when transporters have become much more important. And then finally, the analysis of the DDI simulation results using a uh, quote unquote guest criterion for different levels of accuracy uh, cutoff, increasing the uh, AUC inhibition and decreasing for AUC induction. I'll describe in more detail what a guest criterion is in a second. And then preparation of the uh, slides and written reports. I'm gonna carry um, through on Jim Fibrazil as one of the uh, key perpetrators, uh, this is a um, inhibitor of uh, enzymes, 2C8 and 2C9, and a number of different uh, transporters. <clears throat> and it's gonna be metabolized to the, uh, to the uh, glucuronide. And so what I'm giving you here is a profile from the point of view of the purely in silico record, which would be, the S plus models that are in black. So all of these black entries are models that have been built <clears throat> by our chem informatics team to give you a initial profile just from the molecular structure. Uh, this probably shouldn't be black because <laughs> this data came from the uh, absorption systems lighthouse database. So I should have turned that to blue. Um, going down, uh, into the um, enzyme substrate classifications, transporter classifications for substrates, and then enzyme and transporter classifications for inhibitors on the parent molecule, gem fibrozil. Uh, I've uh, sort of, you know, indicated when a uh, prediction said that gem fibrozil would be a substrate for a particular enzyme or transporter and included it in these um, lists. If it's underlined, then it has been proven that that prediction of for a particular substrate is accurate in that the experimental results um, coincide with the prediction. Uh, in this case for gem fibrozil, it was predicted with 68% accuracy or confidence that the uh, UGT1A1 uh, enzyme would be, uh, you know, gem fibrozil would be a substrate for UGT1A1, and that would be incorrect. Uh, however, as a substrate for 1A3 and 2B7, those are correct. And you can see that the confidence interval is much higher for those um, predictions. As far as transporter substrates, this is a new module that's been added to ADMET Predictor 10. <clears throat> and you can see that we predicted uh, gem fibrozil as a PGP substrate, an OAT1 substrate, but uh, the one that uh, lines up uh, accurately is OATP1B1. And you can see that that is involved in uh, liver influx for gem fibrozil. And we'll also show in a second that it's part of uh, the gem fibrozil glucuronide. And so we can go down through this. Um, I like to always 
look at the solubility as a function of pH because it tells me immediately what type of um, formulation and uh, gastrointestinal issues might arise. And so when a molecule has a single carboxylic acid with a pKa around four and a half or five, we have low solubility in the stomach, but that solubility increases usually pretty um, much by the time you hit the small intestine. So even if you have a little bit slow dissolution in the stomach, you're still gonna get um, almost complete dissolution due to the rising solubility of the ionized species of the carboxylic acid. The distribution coefficient naturally follows the inverse curve because the octanol water distribution coefficient at low pH when the molecule is neutral will be higher than when it's ionized. This is a part of a chemistry classification and someday I'll finish you know, writing up that uh, idea. So these would be the newer um, information that comes from Admet Predictor 10 for transporters. And I have to um, congratulate uh, the whole team, Pankaj Daga in particular, worked on a lot of the uh, transporter models, Bob Clark and uh, David Miller, who heads up the, that whole group, um, really did a great job on this. Uh, so OATP1B1 substrate, yes, 99%. It's underlined indicating that it's a correct prediction. And so some of these are indicating yes, but not necessarily um, accurate as of today's literature. <laughs> we know that this changes quite a bit uh, over time. We have certain models for transporter KM values, but we haven't added uh, VMAX models due to lack of uh, consistent uh, data and the ability to convert from even an in vitro VMAX uh, in expressed cells or in oocytes or uh, other you know, preparations to the in vivo situation for transporters. So I don't know, you know, that's a tough nut to crack to actually get intrinsic um, transport, transporter rates from in silico and in vitro. A lot of people claim so. That's a different seminar. <laughs> Transporter inhibition classification, um, OAT1 inhibition, yes, but uh, no evidence in the literature for that. OAT3 inhibition, yes, and definitely um, that's uh, gem fibrosils and OAT3 inhibitor. And all of these others are no's, which uh, in particular for uh, OATP1B1 and 1B3, those no's are not quite correct, but the confidence interval for either yes or no on some of these are pretty low. Okay, now you know what that is. Um, this just shows you know, what we try to collect in terms of solubility as a function of pH, and then fit the um, microspecies. This would be the salt solubility in blue, and this would be the unionized solubility in uh, brown. And um, the lowest value uh, would be the actual solubility uh, at that given pH, and that's the green line. So if we can line up the green values with the experimental data, then we can get to, at least from the point of view of uh, one data set, what the uh, pKa to be used in the modeling would be. <clears throat> Gem fibrozyl glucuronide is um, an acyl glucuronide. And acyl glucuronides are slightly different than the uh, glucuronides that are formed from hydroxyl groups. This is much more labile. And so we'll see in the gem fibrozyl modeling process that the uh, enteropatic recirculation, the biliary secretion of the gem fibrozyl glucuronide back into the lumen of the intestine and then complete hydrolysis is something that has been added to Gastro Plus 9.8 in order to uh, actually accommodate some of these um, simulations that we started um, uh, last summer. And so you're getting the benefit of not only 
the documentation of these DDI standards, but also novel software in Gastro Plus that uh, hasn't been available previously. And I won't go through the detail of all of the uh, GEM5 result glucuronide results here, but uh, they'll be in the slides. Okay, extended clearance classification. I think this is a brilliant um, idea that uh, Manthina Pharma at uh, Pfizer and uh, Eamon El Katan uh, collaborated uh, with the other authors from that group to uh, find a very simple way of classifying molecules. This would be a, a form of chemistry classification, <clears throat> looking first at the uh, content of the functional groups and lumping uh, acids and zwitter ions into this side of the uh, figure, which would be on the left side and bases and neutrals on the right side. Then looking at the permeability, either low permeability or high permeability, based on a cutoff that um, was established from MDCK um, uh, methods in the companies uh, that published this. And then looking at the molecular weight. So compounds less than 400 molecular weight or greater than 400 molecular weight make this uh, subclassification of the acids. In the case of Gem5 Brazil, we have a pretty low molecular weight. The molecule is an acid, as I've shown, and it's highly permeable. So it falls into the prediction that the primary route of clearance is gonna be metabolic. And I think we'll see that that's the uh, correct prediction. Um, in the case of the uh, gem fibrozil glucuronide, this glucuronide uh, adds a whole bunch of hydroxyl groups and another you know, carboxylic acid. So it has much lower permeability, it's higher molecular weight, and so it falls into this class 3B for hepatic uptake, which you know we, you know we have demonstrated uh, in vitro studies that show that it is a substrate for uh, OATP 1B1 and 1B3. This is a com comparison between the simple um, rules that were established in the original um, extended clearance classification system publication in a confusion matrix where we have um, observed for various um, molecules being primarily cleared by hepatic uptake or by metabolism or by uh, renal excretion. And then we have predicted for uh, hepatic uptake metabolism or renal clearance. And the ideal situation would be to have all your molecules on the diagonal where the predicted matches the observed for the primary route of clearance. Uh, there are some um, outliers in this area and we won't get into a lot of the discussion about that, but I think the concept of this ECCS system is quite valuable just still working purely in silico. We've developed a, a neural network ensemble for this um, S plus uh, human clearance mechanism, we call it. And you can see that the performance on the diagonal is uh, very similar to the performance using the experimental data that is generated at, at Pfizer. A little bit higher um, coverage and uh, the uh, concordance. Okay, so from a purely in silico record, you can see right here, <clears throat> every time we start a project, we try to import the molecular structure as record number one, and we never change that. In fact, it's um, in the database and it's protected from uh, batch updates in the uh, view and edit tables. We now, in all of the DDI standard models that will become available, we have a full set of GastroPlus records and support files, but we've also added extensive comments to the um, comment section. And all of these are, are generated automatically by the uh, structure import. So you can learn more about the ECCS classification and the um, 
S plus mechanistic clearance classification, both of which suggest metabolism is the primary route of clearance. Uh, there's also some data that is human values for RBP and FUP are produced in the database because that was a species we set up when we imported, but it also tells you a little bit about what to expect for rat and then the transporter information. Now on the left side is a purely in silico simulation <clears throat> for a uh, 900 milligram dose of gem fibrozil. And uh, I've plotted it with the uh, concentration in micrograms per mil here at 60 micrograms per mil at the max. And over here, it's in nanograms per mil because we, um, we're we gonna use this as part of a, a DDI simulation. And you have usually got substrates with very low doses and perpetrators with very high doses. So we you know normalize everything to nanograms per mil to get it on one axis. But this is essentially 60 micrograms per mil um, on the same scale. That's a pretty good um, purely in silico simulation because this is not taking into consideration all the mechanisms that are involved over here. This simulation doesn't have enteropathic recirculation, hence the absorption is not going over 100%. This simulation only has the 2C9 and 2C19 enzymes with their KM and Vmax coming from just the molecular structure to create the um, clearance that you see here. Um, this model has some in silico parameters, but wherever we can find in vitro data to parameterize the KMs for the transporters um, and for the um, other enzyme, enzymatic processes that are involved in clearance, you can have um, the values over here. It's a uh, PBPK model with a 23-year-old male, 73 kilos, and then all the mechanisms that were uh, applied to this simulation on this side. And this particular um, plasma concentration time profile comes from a paper by Hunkalami in 2011. I'm going to move a little bit quickly through this. So our conclusions and recommended testing based on just in silico properties are, first of all, low solubility in the stomach probably is not going to reduce bioavailability, but may result in slower dissolution and longer Tmax. Low molecular weight and high permeability and acidic PKA of the parent gem fibrozil suggest mainly metabolic clearance by phase one and 2C9 and 2C19 were predicted by this as well as phase two where UGT1A3 and 2B7 were also predicted as um, gem fibrozil being a substrate for those molecules. ADMAT predictor 10 transporter module suggests possible liver and kidney influx. Uh, the high molecular weight, low permeability acidic PKA of gem fibrozil glucuronide suggests systemic clearance by hepatic renal influx. And then both the parent and glucuronide metabolites may be involved in drug-drug interactions. So you can learn quite a bit about a molecule just simply by importing the structure. So the outline um, for creating a GastroPlus uh, project, and I'm going to start using the nomenclature that will be involved in GastroPlus X here. This is, um, I didn't specifically say GastroPlus database as opposed to a GastroPlus project, and that's the format that we're going to apply to the new um, version of GastroPlus. And uh, It could be that uh, this slide um, is great in the wrong places. Oh, no, it's not. Actually, we've already covered this section <laughs> of the uh, classification. So next, uh, we're going to talk about literature collection, workbook with multiple sheets for all of the mechanistic processes, including um, clinical studies and drug-drug interaction studies. OK. Um, this is just a uh, subset of uh, references. 
<clears throat> and you can see that we've adopted a format for naming these PDF files that involves the uh, first author's last name, the journal abbreviation, the uh, volume, the number, the page, and the year of that particular citation. The beauty of naming your uh, references and PDFs in this fashion consistently is that you can simply go into the um, file explorer, uh, find the subdirectory that has all of your um, full PDF um, um, files and copy the name of the file and paste that into your spreadsheet or into the comment section of Gastro Plus so that you have multiple ways of documenting where all the information came from. And you make liberal use of putting your initials in and the date so that when people open up these databases in 10 years, they'll know who to go to to, you know, whine about in, improper uh, values or mistakes that people make. Uh, you know, th this is just a, a really good system to um, categorize. And I'm sure that everybody has their own methodology on this, but we found it to be pretty useful. Uh, this is just some screenshots of the type of uh, workbooks that will become available for all of these DDI standards. And uh, this is the entry level um, first page for physical chemical properties, where we list the property, we list the value, and then what references were involved in, in collecting that information. Uh, you can see in this case, we had both A to B and B to A KCO2 permeability from absorption systems lighthouse database available. Uh, the ratio is 0.8, so there's probably not um, a lot of uh, you know, PGP efflux involved in gem fibrozil itself. Taking a geometric mean of these two values gives us a KCO2 um, number that can be then used in Gastro Plus with one of the built-in conversions to generate a human jejunal PEF. And that would be 5.6 times 10 to the minus four centimeters per second, essentially a, a, a very high uh, permeability for the gem fibrozil parent molecule. Blood to plasma concentration ratio, sometimes we can find experimental, sometimes we can't and uh, fraction unbound, et cetera. We also have access to two important valuable databases, the um, BioBite, uh, LogD, um, and PKA, and LogP database. The BioBite is, is a company that was founded by Corwin Hanch and Al Leo, and that has tens of thousands of molecules with experimental values of the uh, log P and log D. The other one is, of course, the Lighthouse database. Um, you can contact uh, absorption systems if you're interested in this, but they have um, several hundred um, molecules uh, that have been extensively studied in a number of different assays for permeability and uh, uh, microsomal turnover uh, and other characteristics. This would be another shot of the uh, type of pages that you'll find where we usually grab a screenshot of some of the raw data and then compile it into uh, tables so that it makes it easy to <clears throat> not only see what the reference is and document when the information was uh, added to these spreadsheets, but uh, you know, you can go over to the index of the spreadsheet and pull up different studies that you want. This is um, a typical output for the uh, drug-drug interaction module where <clears throat> it proposes for the uh, substrate, the fraction, the percent absorbed percent to the portal vein, percent bioavailable, Cmax, Tmax, and then the AUCs, uh, prior to drug-drug interaction, zero to T and zero to infinity. The perpetrator, same values, and then a uh, oh, uh, 
if there's a metabolite, you can um, put that in as well. The final uh, values for the change in Cmax and Tmax and AUCs during do, at, as a function of the drug-drug interaction, and then this final line, which would be the substrate change ratio for the uh, interaction. And in this case, <clears throat> we see that this is a induction experiment with rifampicin. Uh, three milligrams of midazolam was given 12 hours after the last dose of rifampicin at 600 milligrams PO once a day for six days. And you can see the um, increase in the liver and the gut uh, jejunum uh, expression of <clears throat> 3A4, as well as the uh, increase in the uh, expression of 1A3, UGT 1A3. So here's a plot of the uh, baseline with no induction, and this is a plot of the baseline, now much lower uh, AUC, and the ratio here is only 2.9% of the initial AUC. Uh, we I'll provide the um, spreadsheet for perpetrator tables. This is just as um, a convenience so that if you would like to uh, rapidly go in and modify the entire perpetrator table or add your own references for uh, other um, new mechanisms that, that uh, pop up in the literature, you can use this, you can sort it, you can add um, a particular new citation or reference for a mechanism. And then in Gastro Plus, you can import a tab delimited ASCII text formatted um, form of this page, and then you have a new Gastro Plus database for that. The uh, current Rifampicin perpetrator table has more than 400 rows um, of information. The now the documentation in the comment section of these databases is uh, much more extensive. Uh, I put an et cetera here, et cetera here, et cetera here, and et cetera here because this was too large to actually uh, you know show as a complete uh, text item in uh, the slides for this talk. But you know it it is reiteration of information. But, you know, at least in my case, <laughs> with, you know, uh, aging, lack of um, memory, I, I have to always be uh, reminded of where things came from and what's going on. Okay, biotransformation pathway in GEM Fibrozil is both oxidative, and these are um, three oxidative metabolites. And I think the um, metabolite three, which is this one, is the major um, oxidative uh, pathway for 2C9, 2C19. But all of these still have the uh, carboxylic acid, so they're all subject to glucuronidation and formation of the uh, glucuronide metabolite. And so you can see that the acyl glucuronides are far outweigh it for urinary excretion, uh, the A-glycones. <clears throat> The reason that these numbers don't add up to 100%, even though they're extrapolated to infinity, is that um, we're not accounting in this case for the glucuronide covalent attachment to uh, various proteins in the um, uh, biological system. And that is the mechanism of gemfibrozil glucuronide's main inhibition of uh, various enzymes, 2C8 in particular, for this um, for this set of studies. So we get 66% um, excreted in the urine in five days and about 6% excreted in the feces. This is a different uh, publication talking about a similar set of numbers for the uh, excretion. That's only 48 hours, whereas the first one was for um, five days. The, uh, this slide describes the uh, mechanism of the glucuronide 
um, covalently attaching to some uh, reactive species. And uh, I think in this case, it's a heme protein, but yeah, it could be other enzymes. This is a complicated slide. And I wanted to, you know, make this, make you aware of the extensive mechanisms that have been added to our DDI models, the DDI standard models. Uh, I worked with Saima Subhani in the summer, um, who uh, was working as an intern <clears throat> from the uh, uh, graduate program. And you can see there are a number of processes. So administration of gem fibrozil, we're gonna have a lower solubility in the gut, but um, high absorption because of that uh, process of transfer from the stomach into the small intestine and complete dissolution. In the gut, um, there's 2C9 and 2C19 in the gut wall, creating some level of metabolites. <clears throat> and also UGT2B7 in the gut wall on that first pass, uh, creating some of the uh, gem fibers of glucuronide, which can cross the uh, basal lateral membrane through transporters. Then we have OATP1B1 for both of these molecules, allowing it to be uh, influxed into the liver. And in the liver, any of the original gem fibrozil parent could be um, oxidized to the various uh, metabolites, but all of those um, metabolites can be eventually um, uh, conjugated in a phase two reaction to the appropriate uh, glucuronide. There's going to be two, two pathways for the processing of the glucuronide. One is through uh, MRP2 uh, efflux into the bile across the cantilever membrane, and then um, going through the um, gallbladder to accumulate during fasted conditions and then release of all the contents from the, or most of the contents of the gallbladder. Uh, during fed conditions. And what we lacked in some of the earlier versions of Gastro Plus was the ability to have this metabolite generated and tracked and then be secreted into the lumen of the intestine at the uh, duodenal uh, location and then be hydrolyzed from the glucuronide back into the gem fibrozil molecule. Um, the initial models that we had to build with the older Gastro Plus involved um, uh, very kludgy methods for transport of the glucuronide into the enterocyte where we could apply a hydrolase enzyme. And now we have the ability to simply specify that for these acyl glucuronides, we can easily um, check a box and have all of the metabolite that comes in as a glucuronide converted to the gem fibrozil so that the gem fibrozil itself in the lumen can be reabsorbed according to its permeability. On the other side, <clears throat> in the uh, systemic uh, serosal membrane, the uh, MRP3 uh, can take these glucuronides and push them back into the systemic circulation where they will eventually be you know, secreted, uh, both filtered and um, secreted via OAT3 into the kidney cells in this case, or via glomerular filtration, and eventually um, end up in the uh, urinary excretion. The molecules that are secreted into the inside of the kidney by OAT3 will then be um, Effluxed from the kidney cells into the lumen of the kidney by MRP4. So we're going to add all of these uh, transporters to the uh, eventual model for gem fibrozil. Mike, this is a good place. Um, 
to ask a, a quick poll question and just remind um, everyone that if you haven't already submitted your question through the questions portal, you can do that now. Uh, following Mike's uh, presentation, we will have a panel Q&A session. But are you currently using the DDI module within GastroPlus software? We'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and submit your answer and get right back to the presentation. All right, thank you, Arlene. Um, I'm gonna flip through a couple of these slides because I've kind of described some of the uh, processes here. The gem fibrozil glucuronide <clears throat> um, as an individual molecule has the same pathways that I was just describing um, and this blows it up a little bit. Um, this would describe the uh, process for enteropathic recirculation, and this was the form that you can see now on the enteropathic circulation uh, model, where you would just do a checkbox, and if you have glucuronide, particularly acyl glucuronides, going into the uh, lumen of the intestine, then it would be converted back into the parent. Now, this is probably not a general solution for all compound metabolism. Um, we will definitely in Gastro Plus X, in the upcoming 10 version, have the ability to put any type of enzyme into the lumen for other types of conversion that would be occurring with uh, saturable kinetics, as opposed to just a, a total 100% conversion. Okay, um, going down, model building for individual substrates, nonlinear dose dependence and multiple um, dosing. So uh, this would be um, information for the physical chemical properties and um, information for midazolam, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, we have come up with a newer um, method for calculating the uh, jejunal permeability based on human, and I, actually it should be uh, two L's, I apologize, and uh, anyway, the, um, per, uh, you know, PAP to PEF conversion using the calibrations that were done in human tissue for the jejunum, for the um, uh, cecum and colon, and uh, essentially uh, creating the ability to take experimentally determined oozing chamber permeabilities and convert them into human jejunal permeabilities. And that would be the kind of um, correlation that we can get from that. And that is part of the uh, midazolam model now. Uh, the initial model for uh, midazolam, seven and a half milligram PO solution, <clears throat> Uh, has a exaggerated Cmax that's much too high and a little bit earlier Tmax than you would want. And we were concerned about this, and we've seen this in the past, uh, maybe not to this complete degree, but uh, you know, definitely overshooting. And we found this article um, that was published several years ago. We probably should have found it earlier that uh, midazolam and several other drugs are able to bind to fatty acid binding proteins in the um, enterocytes and in the liver. And <clears throat> our hypothesis is that this binding in a similar fashion to lysosomal trapping will delay the transit of midazolam through the enterocyte and into the portal vein. Uh, it's a good re reference. You should probably take a look at that uh, from the uh, group down in uh, Australia. Anyway, once we add a um, surrogate of this binding, so we reduce the uh, unbound in the enterocyte to 4.4%, then the 7.5 milligram uh, simulation uh, fits quite nicely, as well as the 1 hydroxy metabolite uh, data from the Born, Bornman paper fits quite nicely. 
in the, well, I, I'll do it here. This is the absorption curve in light blue is, or cyan. This is the drop at seven and a half milligrams for the percent metabolized in the gut. So that's the uh, decrease down to the portal vein here, but this is the mass that is um, metabolized in the gut. So watch the pink curve go down and the portal vein go up as we move through the doses. Here's seven and a half, here's 15. Now the pink is lower and the blue is coming up. That's the amount getting into the portal vein versus the amount that's metabolized in the gut. And then we go to 30 milligrams and now the uh, portal vein is um, much higher and the uh, gut metabolism is much lower. And this is due to saturation of 3A4 in the gut using an experimentally determined KM unbound uh, for this um, modeling. This is not fit in any way, shape or form. This is a purely in vitro, in vivo extrapolation using the in vitro KM and the in vitro VMAX for 3A4. Uh, this one shows the baseline simulation for the interaction of ketoconazole with uh, midazolam. And this is uh, seven and a half milligrams one hour after ketoconazole uh, dosed for four days at 400 milligrams. You can see the uh, initial uh, baseline CP time fits quite nicely. And then as ketoconazole inhibits, if we just use a reversible uh, IC50 for this simulation, we don't actually match the AUC of the midazolam after the drug-drug interaction. The observed uh, AUC ratio zero to infinity is 15.9, but the simulation is only 7.6. And we hunted around for um, other information that might hint at a mechanism for ketoconazole that goes beyond what was currently in our DDI standards database. And this publication by Haroff in 2017 provided information about the, um, the IC50 with no pre-incubation, which would be uh, 26 um, nanomolar, and the IC50 after 30 minutes of pre-incubation so we get a small shift in that IC50, but it's enough to tell us that this IC50 following that pre-incubation would be a good value to use for an irreversible or mechanism-based inhibition. And then we optimize the K-inact for this at uh, 0.001 uh, reciprocal minutes. And now using that parameter along with the reversible, uh, we get a simulation ratio of 18.8, .8, uh, and we have a pretty good fit to the CP time, and now you can see the um, liver and gut uh, drop in the uh, fractional 3A4 activity. We're down to the drug-drug interaction simulations. Only a couple of steps to go, and I and need to uh, finish up so we can get into the question and panel. Uh, we have a new field in the drug-drug interaction module, and this is a column called validated. And what the reason that we put this in is because in this documentation, we're adding so many literature references for perpetrator mechanisms that a user would find it kind of confusing to remember which uh, values they want to test. And so we now have a, a validated field with either true or false, so that if you're considering both the uh, mechanisms that are involved in substrate and in perpetrator PBPK, you can check the ones that are validated, uh, you know, that we've tested thoroughly and we have good documentation on. Uh, versus the ones that are in the literature but haven't necessarily been uh, validated. And this just is a blow up showing you a little bit about that. Okay, I apologize for the uh, sound. I can't turn it off right now, but 
it'll it'll only do it twice and then stop. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a GPX meeting. Uh, this just shows the uh, kind of um, simulation that we have for Gem Fibrozil interacting with uh, repaglinide. And uh, again, this is the baseline and this is the uh, CP time for paglinide after the DDI. And you can see we fit that pretty nicely. The reason that I wanted to show some of these um, was to um, talk about this analysis using this guess, guess criterion. Uh, this is a publication by Eleanor Guest. Um, this describes um, a method to say, if you have a DDI simulation, what are the cutoffs that would consider be considered to be a good, accurate DDI simulation? We know in the I don't know how many people would agree, but in the past we've tended to say if the ratio is within twofold for any of these DDI simulations that we are probably uh, in a good validation range. But uh, Eleanor and her other authors uh, pointed out that when the ratios are very, very small for the observed, that the ratio, you know, as, assuming a cutoff of twofold, which would be these outside lines, is too generous to say that that is a good prediction. <clears throat> and so they came up with a, a limiting equation and uh, uh, application of some uh, variability to match the 80 to 125 um, accuracy. And so these small dotted lines indicate that when the AUC ratio is very small, you have a much tighter fit in order to consider it to be accurate. Uh, th this would be just for one simulation that uh, we'll have these in the spreadsheets for all of these drugs. And so you can see if the observed is 2.2 and the simulated is 2.1, you just say, oh, well, that's a pretty good prediction. But this gives the ratio upper limit and lower limit based on the uh, guest values and the same for AUC and of course 5.8 fits in between the uh, upper and lower limit quite nicely. We can also uh, create these plots and these are what we call guest plots and uh, in this case it's fluconazole as the perpetrator versus midazolam using either KI of 15 micromolar or KI of 7.4 micromolar. And you can see that as the values get to a lower level with 15 versus 7.4, the um, we're, we're still within those guess limits. And this is an OPUS um, experiment that uh, Vera Lukachova conducted to optimize the induction parameters for rifampicin. And you can see the massive number of studies and uh, guest plots that were used in doing this um, optimization. And then we do uh, preparation of written reports and conclusions. So I unfortunately got a little bit too, too late, but um, I think you will you know, have access to these slides and move, move forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mike. At this time, I'd like to invite Viera as today's Q&A moderator. I know we did have some questions come in. So what do you have for us? All right, uh, thank you, Arlene. I guess the very first question will be for Grace, um, as it's a question on are the DDI predictions from uh, Gastro Plus um, accepted by regulatory agencies? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so so uh, in our contract studies uh, group, we uh, have done quite a few projects um, related to drug-drug interactions, and uh, they've been accepted uh, by the regulatory agencies, both by the FDA and EMA. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Um, next one, maybe Revati could take this question on. Um, 
can you vary the timing of the doses of two drugs? For example, those gym fibrosil at variable times before a statin is given. Uh, it depends upon what is the perpetrator dose regimen, right? Uh, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, they wanted to know if we can change the administ timing of the perpetrator. Uh, yes, we can do that. All right, all right, thank you. Um, now that we've given my couple of minutes to, to take a breath, <laughs> the, the next question may be coming back to you. Um, in analysis of the transporter substrate prediction, did you get any new insights into selectivity of OCTs, OATs, OATPs? Um, you know, I think the um, Chem Informatics group probably could answer that better than I can. Um, the they they relied on a lot of very good publications that uh, have talked about the structure activity for interaction with transporters, and they collected uh, lots of substrate and non-substrate um, data to build the neural network classification models and give the statistics for the ensemble um, method for calculating that confidence interval. And I personally don't have that um, structural insight. Maybe I, you know, roughly look at um, the charge of the molecule and the kind of functional groups that are involved and the molecular weight think think in terms of the extended clearance classification system uh, but i think the artificial intelligence and the, and the machine learning methods will eventually take the day thank you um i know that we are running a bit over time so um maybe last question mike this one was specific for um jim fibrosil um uh, what is the rationale for taking the geometric mean of KCO2 A to B and B to A if the intestinal lumen blood flow can maintain the concentration gradient, so it can maintain the same condition? Um, why would we be using the geometric mean of A to B, B to A uh, from KCO2? Well, it's it's a good question. I'd have to you know talk a little bit more because I haven't considered the um, last part of the question with regard to the maintaining um, sync conditions. But what we're trying to do is get to <clears throat> um, as close to just the passive permeability as possible. And we, uh, in the past, have experimented with taking an average of A to B and B to A. Um, we've done some experiments with a pharma company who had a vast database of KCO2 experiments where they had A to B, B to A, and um, KCO2 inhibited, or PGP inhibited KCO2 studies. And we found that the geometric mean of the A to B and the B to A most closely approximated those uh, inhibited uh, KCO2 studies. And so that's why we were shooting for that as the passive permeability. Um, I know I said the last question, but maybe one more, if uh, either Grace or Evati could answer this one. Um, can you make simulations with um, different complex situations, let's say different ages, uh, sexes, and, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh. <laughs> no, that's okay. It was a that's short okay. answer. <laughs> we we are ahead. running out. We are running out of time, so short and sweet answer was was great. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, I don't know if Arlene has any. Um, I have one more slide, um, but I wanted to uh, list some of the acknowledgments here before we go. I know people are leaving. Um, this whole team of um, DDI standards uh, group, very, very brilliant people, and they've worked very hard on this. Um, Simon Sabani and uh, Suvar Chala were both uh, interns with me in the summer, and my favorite project manager, Andrew Mueller. So I appreciate that, that whole team, and uh, Vera, of course, uh, comes in, saves the day frequently. And so here's the last slide, which Arlene asked me to um, give you a, a promo for the upcoming um, Model Informed Drug Delivery Conference. 
Great. Thank you, Mike, Vera, Grace, and Ravathi. Again, we invite our audience to learn more about GastroPlus on our website. You can find today's presenters, as Mike listed on his slide, at the 2021 MIDD Plus Scientific Conference next week. This concludes our webinar for today. It has been recorded and the slides will be available on our website. We thank you for joining us and we will be back in touch soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.